right. Hello, 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 everyone. Can I get hands up? Okay, the way we usually start uh, conversations at Ethos Lab is we usually say on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling right now? And then the young people put their hands up and put the ones and the 10. So on a scale of one to 10, how are you doing right now? That's awesome. I that, That's amazing. It's 920 in the morning. Some of you had to get your child out of, out of bed this morning to get them to school. And that could have brought you down to a seven or an eight. Some of you um, have just had an amazing breakfast. And you know what? That's really pumped you up. I'm I'm at about 11. I only have 10 fingers, though. So I'm kind of limited by physiology. Um, my name is Antonia Ogundele. Um, I am an extremely curious individual, and I find it very hard to put myself in a box of anything. So it, what's so awesome is seeing different people in the crowd that I'm connected to with any one of my many different lives. Um, today, I'm really going to focus on the stuff outside of my professional or part of my profession. Just basically, I'm going to tell you my story um, about me being here in Vancouver. Awesome. Okay, I thought um, I wanted to start um, initially first to say I'm uh, in Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Suwamish, and tsleil people. Um, and it's always just uh, an honor and, and, and blessing to be here and to be able to do the work that we do um, at Ethos Lab, but also just anything that I've done. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to share the fact that I'm a complex individual. I often run away from, again, being put into a box. And so I wanted to just put up front a warning of sorts that that these are all the different kinds of conversations and, and things that I, I'm interested in. As Mark mentioned, I am obsessed and will talk to anyone about the Philadelphia 76ers winning the NBA Finals based on just complete revenge by Doc Rivers. I, I really hesitated to go into detail on that in this presentation in terms of the ripple effect, um, but I'm impacted and influenced by um, eating a lot of chocolate chip cookies, talking about inequality, obsessed with the metaverse, and, um, and sometimes I dabble it in a bit of reality TV. Um, but my family is really at the center of, of what I do. Um, and we, we often come together over games of Monopoly deal. If you can just move uh, to the next slide. So now, um, when we're talking about when we're talking about ripples, um, this is the obligatory slide of a drop of water creating that ripple, creating a ripple effect. I actually tried to find lava to see if lava created ripples um, or different other elements that would drop and create ripples. Um, and so, but I actually really like the idea that that ripples. Um, occur and we talk about it within the context of water. Um, and so when I started thinking about, well, what would this conversation be or what would this presentation be about? Um, I didn't, I, I had a hard time thinking through, okay, well, what does that actually mean to me? So I thought about the characteristics of a ripple. You think about the uh, moment of impact or that there's an object that initiates the ripple. Um, and then the ripple goes on and on and on with these small waves extending to a point that I, I believe are immeasurable. And I, and I in, upon reflection, thought about how the measurement of a ripple is actually a fool's errand and is not really the, the goal of the full measurement of the ripple is, is, isn't the goal, but it's just that we've created an impact and, um, and that it might create some sort of change, destabilizing change around you. Um, and so I'm going to uh, move to the next slide here. Um, I wanted to start off with this next image because this was a little bit of a ripple effect to me, but it's just to contextualize the start of the conversation and, and where I'm gonna be going. Um, I don't know how many of you are Boondocks fans out there. It's a, an awesome uh, cartoon that is a satirical comedy about um, <laughs> about a young uh, young kind of woke uh, kid who often uh, is is hyper politicized and his and he lives with his grandfather and his um, his brother, and the grandfather um, talks about how he was part of the civil rights move movement and how he was out there marching in Selma 
But the, the truth of the story is, is that when people were being hosed down, grandpa was out getting his raincoat. Uh, and he keeps talking about how I was there, I was marching with everyone, but he was he was somewhere else. And so everyone in the crowd kind of talks about uh, in the crowd in that group, but in in the flashbacks talks, says to him, you weren't around with us. You were out trying to be you were trying to get yourself ready um, and you were just trying to keep yourself comfortable. And for myself, um, at the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement, when we start thinking about 2013, when I actually just came here to Vancouver. Um, I didn't want to be like grandpa. And it, this was the image that came to my mind all the time. Am I going to be out there getting my raincoat? Or am I going to, uh, what can, might I be able to do to be able to uh, make a change? And so I do ask, as you think about this, this is the context, but ask yourself about who doesn't want to get wet by the ripples that are happening right now. So if we move to the next slide, um, when we when we start thinking about ripples, it, it is about thinking about the long game, um, about what type of creative impact we might make in a particular moment, and then there is a measurable Im impact, and we don't really again understand or know um, where it's going. It's a it's a moment, uh, the impact of of creating a ripple effect, and I really focus and and think about and reflect on those moments. Uh, uh, that have created those um, impactful or creative um, inspirations for change. And, and so the first slide I shared with you showed a drop of water into um, a larger body of water creating a ripple. And so I'm going to give two different um, objects that create ripples as I think about what I've been doing in my life over the last number of years. And it really all starts with pancakes. So pancakes are my drop of water. Um, having breakfast over pancakes uh, with over pancakes with friends and having conversations with friends over breakfast. Um, that's often where I find a lot of creativity. Um, breakfast, uh, pancakes are a disarming uh, type of breakfast situation. It usually reflects that you have a lot a bit more time to really dig into different things. It means you're relaxed and it often opens opens a opens a space up to uh, consider uh, what might be possible. And if you move to the next slide, as I think about um, that larger body of water that these pancakes fall into, if you go back one slide, um, the ripple effect consists of when we think about what happens in community, the ripples are the waves of conversation, the waves of connections and shifting of culture that happens when we create the impact um, that that we we set out to do, and so I'm going to share um, kind of three instances um, of which pancakes were an initiator um, of uh, were an initiator of of creating some ripple effects and the types of conversations, connections, and culture shifting moments that occurred uh, from uh, from uh, what had happened. What what happened? We move to the next slide. Awesome. I'm, I just see in the chat, I want pancakes. I always want pancakes. Everybody always wants pancakes. They're, they're just such a wonderful breakfast, uh, breakfast meal. Um, so this is a, this is a, a store. This is a storefront that my husband and I um, own in uh, Gastown. We've had many conversations over pancakes. We're both urban planners. Um, we both really enjoy and um, activating space. And this is an eight by four closet of a condo that we had, that, that we have. And when we initially got it, um, that was initially what we thought was how might we be able to activate the street. Um, we've had many breakfasts and many pancakes and many conversations around what was possible. Um, and so it's not necessarily a particular moment, but multiple moments of having breakfast with my husband that the cheeky proletariat um, was imagined. Uh, this is was not uh, a call. It wasn't just, again, a particular uh, conversation or moment, but it was accumulation of thinking about, um, if you look, remember back to my last slide, 
thinking about inequality, thinking of access to space, thinking actually to access of being able to share um, your imagination. And so um, the Cheeky Proletariat, uh, the purpose uh, around the space is that it, it is a, a space of free, the free expression of all people. I really hesitate to call it a gallery because then that puts it in a box. And I think I mentioned earlier, I'm afraid of boxes as much are uh, drops of water, uh, afraid of being constrained, um, having constrained ripples. Uh, and, uh, and so this space, uh, the intention is to engage and allow people who may not necessarily traditionally or categorically be defined as artists to be able to share work that they do on their um, on their spare time. Um, and so if we move uh, to the next slide. The conversations that we were that uh, were able to be initiated from this uh, emanated around kind of where are you from, which was the first major piece out of there uh, that I had never, I've never done that type of work before um, that I was able to put in there. Um, and then it was also, uh, if you look in the top left hand corner and her name escapes me, was the first person outside of, um, outside of myself that went into the cheeky proletariat. Um, there have been people who are caretakers, who uh, do fashion design on the side to, um, people who are teachers that just started writing a book, people that are musicians that are um, that wanted to transition into just trying out some art, um, to people just wanting to tell their story and share their and share their uh, share their impact. Again, I think in the opportunity of creating this space for the free expression of all people, um, I don't really understand or know how far this could possibly go. Um, to, if you look in the bottom right hand corner image, that's a very similar, exact similar size gallery that popped up in Edmonton, inspired by um, what we had done in Vancouver. Um, and so as I talk about kind of this ripple effect and the fool's errand of trying to measure how far our impact goes, I feel it's just a blessing to be able to make that initial moment of creative impact and, and and it will just it will kind of take on wings uh, as it as it will as it goes. And um, and so I mentioned a little bit about inequality. I mentioned a little bit about not wanting to be in boxes. I've uh, I have many a times looked at the in between as spaces of impact. And what that looks like is uh, I I think I shared in my bio um, that I'm inspired by Jay Dilla, who's a producer. And what was special about Jay Dilla is that he often produced impact at the on the or started his tracks on the offbeat. So it was always unexpected. The cheeky proletariat truly was unexpected. Um, but uh, when uh, actually the actual space operates in an in between, it it doesn't it isn't actually zoned to really be um, what it is. Um, but it just is what it is. And um, but the proletariat piece spoke to, again, speaks to inequality and really speaks to the idea of mobilizing people. And, and my husband and I had an opportunity to go down to Los Angeles um, because I started getting really interested in what collective land ownership might look like. Again, this in-between that need, still needed to be um, understood at a particular time. Um, so went to uh, Trust South LA, uh, hung out with um, many people in the Black community there, um, in the Latino community there, that were starting to think about addressing gentrification within the context of um, within the context of their neighborhood, and it really sparked a lot of ideas. Some other land trusts were popping up as well, um, Chicago, um, uh, within again the Black community there, to uh, Parkdale Land Trust. Uh, that was happening out of Toronto and the Kensington Land Trust. And so if we move to the next slide, pancakes needed to be had again. It was another moment to start thinking about what type of impact might be made. And what pancakes, again, also what they do is they bring the people together to create that droplet, to create that impact in being able to disrupt these spaces. And and what that really initiated these conversations and these meals around the table was moving to the next slide, um, really digging into a conversation and, and looking at 
um, what is the broader impact of looking at removing the Densmere and Georgia viaducts, not just in terms of, uh, you know, let's take taking them down and let's have a plaque or just a center, but what might it look like to actually create intentionally a ripple effect into the legacy of that space around collective uh, community land ownership in terms of a land trust, but also um, starting to think about how, you know, when when they do come down, what is the impact of what, who, who are the people that will be there? And that's the next generation of young people. And if you look to the next slide, the types of conversations that were created were really around opening up the truth about this place. Um, it was also a conversation about really opening up the dialogue around systematic racism and black leadership and not only reimagining this space, uh, reimagining this space, but also in addressing um, and also to addressing uh, the systematic again systematic racism that the city of Vancouver continued to perpetuate and continues to perpetuate that has had its recent reckoning within the pan within the pandemic. Um, the I would say that there was a huge watershed moment in bringing and having everyone come together to be able to begin this conversation. But it really was about the uh, it was really about pancakes. It was really about the conversations around the table that initially started getting having this go, uh, the momentum going. Um, so I founded the Hogan's Alley Land Trust, which evolved into the Hogan's Alley Society. Um, with a it was a a, a combination of two uh, amazing organizations, and I think when we think about ripples. Um, that it's not just usually it's not just one drop of water that's falling into the into the body, um, but that I stand in the ripple of many other organizations that have been doing a lot of great work within the city, but I also stand in the ripples of our ancestors and um, uh, and other people that have come before, and uh, definitely in the ripple of my of of my mother. Um, it also again created these amazing connections. Um, and and I, it's not it's it's often to hear um, I met you at that Hogan's Alley thing, um, and and that's just a I think a beautiful um, a beautiful uh, illustration of how of how we move for of how we we come together in these different moments and the cultural impact um, I think undoubtedly we're all kind of sitting in it we all see what's happening and the work that the Hogan's Alley Society is absolutely crucial in being able to uh, address, let's think about the harmful ripples that have happened from the impact from the extreme Im uh, impactful uh, displacement strategies of the city of Vancouver from history, and starting to think about the different ripples that we can make to start uh, creating some change. So again, the society's work is, is truly important. Um, and again, as I said, I, I, I don't like to fit in a box. And I don't like, and and I often like to see how how ripples can actually continue to to move and understanding it. And so, we move to the next slide. It happened again. I had some pancakes. Pancakes are a dangerous thing for me, as you can tell. So if you're gonna have pancakes with me, um, just know something might be happening afterwards that might create some ripples. Um, but really, again, the conversation, um, the conversations that were being had come back to looking at that conversation around inequality. I became uh, an amazing mama to an amazing teenage girl. And I saw very quickly the ripple effect of the inequality that happens within the education system. Um, those that have access to certain programming and those that don't, in particularly in the enrichment space. And also in uh, the creation of spaces uh, especially when we think about the, um, especially when we think about uh, systematic racism, and we think about how, what is the culture in which these other spaces that um, young people are participating in, what are they created in? And so I move to the next space that uh, I move to the next slide, where um, Ethos Lab was inspired again over uh, brunches, conversations around how do we address and start to begin to reimagine what space might look like when there's uh, when black when there are black leaders creating the space creating a space that actually centers and looks at the needs of my daughter and creating a more inclusive space for all young people um, and so the purpose of ethos lab 
is to empower youth to transform community and shift culture. And we do that by providing access to emerging technologies, tools, mentorship, and resources to support them in their personal development. Because we believe that all young people should have access to creating their own ripples, to them having their moment um, to be able to build the, the more inclusive future that they're actually all asking for and wanting to see. Um, if we move to the next slide, I, I can't begin to understand the magnitude of the ripples that would be made by having by creating the ethos lab. It's often a conversation that I have with other with parents and people that say to me, I wish I had this when I was younger. And so here it is. So what are the possibilities and the ripples that might come out from this from these conversations around identity, race, who we are in both the digital and physical space to also thinking about how we might make um, science, technology, engineering, and math more accessible to the populations that are currently underrepresented in the space, mainly Black youth and mainly, and also girls. Black youth are girls too. <laughs> and so what's really, um, uh, but for us, it's, it's about creating that space that all young people have access to around living and walking out practically what an anti-racist community looks like. And so we also invite the empathetic and active participation of non-Black youth in the space to be able to start having these early conversations, um, early conversations around what it might be like to be together in a different way. And so I wanted to share um, uh, what a very quick, it's a 20 second or 30 second video of what I hope to be actually the beginning um, of a ripple. Uh, my name's Kill and I'm in grade seven. Well, when I grow up, I do want to be a scientist and engineer for robots. We were coding like facial recognition and text to speech. And I like how like it was like easy to like plug it in. Like some other things are like really hard, like on other softwares. The part I like the most about it is like when like, the thing is done, like where you put all the blocks and then you get the results. That's just cool. For some people that don't get to experience it, I think I'm like really lucky and hopefully like other people one day get the chance. We had an opportunity to partner with, um, we had a, a, the opportunity to partner with uh, Cortic Technology, um, which is a local startup, uh, also a New Ventures VC partner, very similar like ourselves, um, to, um, to be able to bring AI uh, coding to young people. And so we couple it with conversations around bias uh, and and what are the cultural impacts associated with artificial intelligence, and and then they get to learn the back end to understand how they might be able to change it into the future. And so I wanted to just share this one quote from. Um, I'll leave it up on the screen, and you can maybe take a quick read through it because I know we're running a bit a bit behind. Um, but just that there is uh, an opportunity right now um, when we think about when we think about impact and we think about these different ripples. Um, where does it start and what is the intention? And our hope is that we're able to, again, help Kayla and others uh, be able to make their own ripples as well. And so, of, of course, uh, I have the space right now, if you move to the next slide, if you would like to make a ripple within the Ethos Lab community, there's an opportunity to give. Um, and we just finished our Black Futures Month campaign. Uh, where we raised uh, $15,000 in community, um, but recently received um, a $10,000 uh, donation from Equitable Bank and also $15,000 from Van City Credit Union. Um, so we are still um, trying to reach our $100,000 goal and you can give in that way. Um, if you have a young person, a teen, who is interested in being a part of a really creative community, uh, we also invite you to um, to invite your young person to join. Um, and we have a March break camp coming up as well. And so we would love if, uh, if, if you could share and let your young person know about this. I wanna move to like the, when I talk about again, the ancestors and, and the ripples and, um, and kind of an, a bit of an origin story. Um, I wanna move to the next slide. And I'm gonna try not to cry that my mom didn't know the ripple she would make by having me. She passed away 
a couple, two years ago now, and it was the anniversary of her passing this past Wednesday, which had a little bit of a ripple effect for me. But you don't really know the impact that you'll have on the people around you, or even when you leave, the ripple that will continue. And so when you move to the next slide, this is me. When I was in high school, my Bantu knots, I didn't know who I would be at that time. And neither again, did I know the impact that my mother would have on me. And I just, um, I just encourage you that it's, it's not about measuring the full depth and, and length and breadth of how many people you impacted. It's just that you started and that just that you tried and that you're actually standing in the ripple of ancestors and people around you who've come before you. So I just want to thank you so much for uh, listening to me today. <laughs> and I uh, truly appreciate uh, Creative Mornings for this opportunity. Yeah, hi, Antonio. Thank you very much for all the work you are doing. Uh, one of the repel effect I have observed recently is the face of Viola on the money $10 bill. And every time I make sure whenever I uh, go to buy my grocery and there's a change, I ask them to give Viola. And now I'm known as a Viola man because <laughs> in the bank, I also demand that I need money in, in, in bills of $10 Viola. My question is now, the imp what do you see the ripple effect of that? Because the two things I've noticed uh, while talking to the cashiers at the grocery store who are twins, one said that she wrote a paper on Viola as a, as a school project. And the second one said the cashier that she gave somebody a Viola for change and she refused to take the money. She said, no, she doesn't want Viola. So I don't know, there has been a positive impact and the negative impact of, of the ripples. So, because the bank machines don't give out any money in $10 bill. So the circulation of Viola is also limited by bank machines. So my question is, what is the impact of ripple effect of Viola? Oh my goodness, that's such a uh, really great and thoughtful question, especially when you talk about the circulation of, of Viola Desmond. Um, I know when the doll, when that, uh, when that denomination came out, um, especially for my daughter who has just a stack of them, there was not a lot of circulation happening, I think in general, because I know that a lot of young black people and definitely members of the black community and likely others in the crowd here have also held on to it to understand that it's a really important part of not only uh, Canadian history around understanding what what um, how Viola Desmond you know stood up for herself um, at that in that time in history, but also just the fact that it's actually on on the denomination. So um, I think that it's it's just that what you talked about Shiraz is that it's starting it's starting the conversation and that that's the impact. The ripple effect to it both on the positive side and the negative side is that you're able to see how people are able to either keep these kind of waves going the positive waves going but at the same time where are those different spaces of possible disruption where other ripples might need to be intervene to be able to um ensure that this this like really great uh story in history is told um so yeah i i when I I know for myself it was extremely impactful um, to to see the note, um, but uh, yeah, I, that's that's kind of my extent of my conversation is uh, is that it really it, sorry the extent of my response is that it is initiating a conversation and hopefully um, the ripple effect will kind of go whichever way it goes. It's just we just hope that it would be a lot more positive. We have another question from Marion who will join us. Hi, Marion. Marion. <laughs> hey. You're on mute. 
Oh, I think there might be need to be some moderator. Oh, there now. Okay. I wasn't able to unmute myself. Before. Hi, Antonia. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I've been out of town for about four months. So I'm just, um, and really wanting my kids to sort of take part in the ethos lab, but they're, they're pretty busy doing a whole bunch of stuff. That's why I read a town. <laughs> um, and um, I just wanted, my biggest question for you is a lot of the stuff you're talking about, you know, it, you just, it sounds so easy when you say it, <laughs> but it's actually very complicated. I mean, I'm another artist and, and, and so I, and a teacher. And so I think about how complicated it really is to not only um, get youth involved, youth of all ages, you seem to have physical spaces, online spaces, artists involved other companies that are co-partnering and then funding. I mean, this is a huge multi-pronged effect, really. It's not as simple as you say. So, <laughs> so I just want to know how you approach. I mean, that's a lot of work. Let's be honest. That is so much work. How have you done it? Yeah. Um, uh, relationship. Relationship and pancakes. I'm not going to lie. Um, I uh, have been in a career of, of, you know, 15 year career in emergency and disaster planning and did a lot of community stuff on the side. So for, me, for, for many, many years and I uh, haven't actually done anything independently of my own kind of like personal volition until I moved to Vancouver. Um, and so there were a lot of seeds that were sown um, over the years and basically just said, hey i want to try and make some changes and um and so a lot of the different partners or connections that might be brought in was because i have uh, fostered a relationship that it maybe even for five years or or, mm -hmm. or, way or or longer than that um but what's been i think really like beautiful about the whole thing is that um uh, and and Didi and I kind of talk about this, and I'm sure in your work too, like light attracts light, right? And um, and so it just has kind of moved in a way that um, I definitely can't also take credit for. And just like um, I'm a woman of faith, and God really moves in 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 different ways. So I've been really blessed in that way. Um, I'm also very intentional. Uh, I struggle with accepting possibly being like a bit like a visionary thinker around mm. that. Um, and so when Ethos Lab started, or when we launched last year, there was not buy-in. Like, there were some people that were cool with it, but I'll tell you this, I, we were making pancakes in physical space, and like, one kid would show up, maybe two, and like, it's pancakes. <laughs> so I thought that it would be great. And that didn't happen. We didn't actually start seeing our impact until COVID hit and we were online. And so you don't really know how it will kind of catch fire. And I think that um, COVID actually presented an opportunity for us to be able to lean in and really be with young people in a meaningful way. Um, and I, uh, the murder of George Floyd made a huge shift in um, the collective consciousness around um, what it might be to decenter white supremacy from in creating space. And so I had par parents now be like, oh, I get it. Whereas before, when I was initially saying we want to create a space that actually centers Black youth and, and actually takes an anti-racist approach, um, I'd have parents say to me, oh, I understand that there are a lot of Black kids that will be there. Like, will my child be comfortable? Like, that was a typical conversation. Um, and so uh, things have kind of come around, um, but there are still many barriers around, um, again, class, race, gender in terms of how people um, choose to either engage their young people or not engage their young people within Ethos Lab. So it's still mm -hmm. quite difficult. I still I still cry. <laughs> it's still hard, uh, but it's a lot of work. Will you, will, you, will you tell us just a bit more about the different kinds of labs that are um, available when they happen, how you organ, how you, uh, sorry, register exactly what, how the whole thing goes? Yep. It was put I in could, the chat. If I could just oh. step in. We have two more questions and we're, we're, we're okay. hitting the wall. So maybe I'm, th I'm going to say thank you, Marion. Thank you for the questions. Okay, very thank thoughtful. You. I'm going to say goodbye to Marion. And if you can keep those questions that she just asked you in mind, maybe you can work that into the next couple. That's exactly uh, what I'll try and do. Okay. okay. <laughs> so let's, let's, uh, let's invite Carla to say hello. Hi, Carla. This is so cool. Hello. 
Oh, hi. How are you? Hi, <laughs> nice sweet Antonia. Thanks so much for uh, for a wonderful chat. Um, yeah, I am Carla from Brands for Better. I'm uh, really excited to host you at the Brand Battle for Good uh, on uh, on day two uh, for another chat. So, uh, thank you so much for this morning. Um, yeah, I uh, I just I just wanted to first say I really connected with what you said about uh, you know looking in between uh, spaces for for impact. It's a very powerful statement. Um, but uh, you know, kind of on a personal professional level, um, you know, another another project that we're working on uh, with uh, Brands for Better is um, something called the Spark Factor, um, where we're going to be uh, kind of uh, re -en engaging youth, uh, you know, tapping into brands to inspire youth, um, you know, to to seek roles in some of these awesome awesome jobs, awesome impact spaces that we're we're working within. Um, I guess I was just kind of curious um, as to your approach uh, in a remote uh, in a remote environment as to how how, how you and Ethos Lab um, are actually onboarding um, or drawing in the youth um, effectively, yeah. Oh, wow, that's a really big question. And that's the question I get a lot. Um, well, uh, it all depends on the different age groups. Uh, so uh, when they're the 13 to 14, so I'd say Ethos Lab or demographic is strongly in that area, there's a bit more agency on parents to say, hey, I'm gonna sign your kid up. And so that's been a really big thing is that parents saying, hey, you know, join Ethos Lab, which we meet on Tuesdays uh, from 4.30 to 6 p.m. and it's called the lab. And then Thursdays we meet on Discord from 4.30 to 6, which we call Open Studio. And also on Saturdays, 1 to 2.30, which is also called Open Studio. And that is an opportunity for kids to experiment on the things that they learned on the Tuesday and really just a place where they gather to play among us and also work on some homework and some other projects that they might want to work on. But, uh, and that and that's just it actually, is that um, we're still at the beginning, but we're endeavoring to be a space where young people can plug in without any thought. So you might be signed up for basketball, you might be signed up for like uh, Sarah McLaughlin's music courses and many different things. Ethos Lab's that place that you know that you can always kind of plug into and know that you have a supportive community to essentially hack your life, which mm -hmm. is what I like to say about it. Um, and, and so it's been parents mainly, um, and we're starting to look at how we can grow our community using, again, um, arts-based practices uh, and other ways in which we can meet young people where they're at. Um, I am, watch out, there might, I, I'm really inspired by the 1990s street teens, and uh, so that will likely be our new approach to, to getting young people on board. But right now, it is, it is parents. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. And lastly, Humaira is going to come and be our final question of the day. Hello, Humaira. Assalamualaikum. Antonia, thank you so much, first of all, for your courage and your light and your wisdom and sharing a lot of your, um, what sounds to me like your heart. I'm so, I'm so grateful. Um, and I see a lot of it reflected. Um, I wrote this down so that I don't wander too much. I just wanted, I'm curious about as a fellow boundary worker and like creative that, you know, you don't want to be stuck with the labels, but you do think expansively and, and in a visionary way. And um, you've mentioned some of the things I heard you say what's helped, right? Relationships, your intentionality, and some of um, people learning what's up and why things are important. Um, that's happened a lot in the last couple of years. And I'm curious if there's any other of like community level competencies and structures that you're excited to see grow, especially in the Pacific Northwest of Turtle Island, um, that can help lubricate the kinds of spaces and the kinds of work that you and folks that you're connected to um, are visioning up. Like the things that, it, that you've kind of like bumped up against and you're excited for that to no longer be um, similar to what you said, people being like, I don't understand why you would need this kind of space. And now the light is on. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to give possibly a controversial statement, and then I'll talk about kind of what I think. Uh, yeah, one is when when Donald Trump was elected. I have to tell you, it was probably one of the most freeing days of my life. Mm. I no longer had to spend a lot of time and work convincing people that systematic racism existed or that racism existed at all. Like it was, it literally. I felt completely unshackled um, by it because I think a couple of months earlier, the Times had released an article on a post-racial society 
and like academic journals were writing about post-racial like world it was shocking to me um and so it was like that that kind of watershed moment that made like that really cleared me up and i think that it's really looking again at those different like watershed moments um that and kind of being able to read kind of what is happening um uh, that i'm really excited about the opportunity happening in the digital realm right now um and i think that there is a ton of opportunity there um in particular around um digital worlds and like metaverses and digital spaces and so i'm uh there are a couple of people that are doing some really great work uh more west coast than just like pacific northwest that are starting to really challenge these conversations in particular around like racial identities and representation within a digital space um, because that's where that's where we're going and that's where we're heading and um in my initial slide i i had kind of a metaverse there i am deeply concerned about the relevance of the black body in the digital space yeah and um because i also this is another fairly controversial statement is that um the conversation around black lives matter like if you put it like do black lives matter in society and and i felt like the answer was no like the way the way the world was operating and i was like okay well if that's this the tenant let's how to like let's shift that and let's think through that and that is kind of where I, when i see the digital realm it like we just fundamentally cannot exist because of the technological technological limitations or understanding the back end the fact that like that ai or um other technology can recognize us um, and there's going to be so much more integration. So I think that there's a lot of conversations happening around that, and I'm really digging into that space right now. Um, and and so I think that there is opportunity for for kind of reigniting and lubricating some some aspects of movement within that particular space. Oh. If, that, if that answers your your oh, no, but thanks so much. Yes, beautifully <laughs> said. And I'm sure there's more conversations to come. But thank you, thanks, CM team. <laughs>